James Day, public television pioneer and chairman of the CUNY TV Advisory Board, passed away in April 2008. His legacy includes the series Day at Night, which aired for 130 episodes beginning in 1973. The program features interviews with many of the great thinkers and achievers of the 20th century. These 30-year-old programs have been restored. The interviews remain fresh and relevant today, exploring issues that are still important to society. Showing them again is CUNY TV's tribute to Jim and his contributions to public television. Deciding whether Jonathan Winters is the funniest man alive is as futile as trying to decide virtue among thieves. It is enough that he's funny. His rare gift of mimicry was first uncovered and developed in his hometown of Dayton, Ohio, where he dropped out of high school to join the Marines, returning after the war not only to finish high school, but also to study at the Dayton Art Institute. His interest in art grows with the passing years. The talent that was nourished in Dayton was exported to the funny bones of the world through television. He's had his own shows in addition to frequent guest appearances through nightclub dates, record albums, and the half dozen movies in which he has starred, including It's a Mad, 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 Mad World. Jonathan, you're reportedly writing a book at which is dedicated, so I am told, to all the people who are overly sensitive. Do you number yourself among those? Well, the full title is, uh, I mean, a dedic the dedication yeah. is, it's dedicated to all people who are overly sensitive. And I put in brackets, it beats being overly bitter. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the title of the book, which I think is kind of fun, it, it's called... Um, uh, I couldn't wait for success. I went on ahead without it. <laughs> I've seen three or four different titles of this book. Is yes. there, in fact, a book? There is a book. Mm -hmm. I've been working on it, uh, Jim, for about, oh, I guess about 15 years. But fortunately, or unfortunately, I've been working a lot. And uh, as you know, uh, to sit down and write a book, and I'm really not, you know, uh, working with a ghostwriter mm -hmm. or anything else. I'm doing it myself. It's very difficult work. It's very difficult. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I know I'm not a novelist by any matter of means. I think I'm somewhat of a writer, if nothing else, with my regard to my comedy. But I, I want to do it myself. It's me. It's, if, if it doesn't sell, that's all right. At least I want one copy mm. so that, I, that my kids can read it, if nothing else. Are you overly sensitive? Yes, I am. Is I, it, uh, is, uh, we know it's a disadvantage in certain no, respects. No, yes, it is a disadvantage mm. to, mm. Um, in, in many ways, because if nothing else, you're very vulnerable sure. to everything. But I think, uh, without sounding uh, corny uh, or saccharine, I think that uh, we that are overly sensitive lead richer lives because of it. Why? Why richer? Well, because we're on a frequency. We're tuned in to more than the guy, certainly, that is hard-nosed and bitter and bugged and is, takes everything just, you know, right down the line and says, all right, you guys, you, you know, uh, who has little or no humor or, mm -hmm. or sensitivity. Mm -hmm. But it does leave you vulnerable sometimes. It does leave you vulnerable. You're very vulnerable to a lot of hurts. And uh, people uh, on a number of occasions are inclined to say cruel things to you. And, and you take everything. An overly sensitive person does take everything. He takes all the arrows, so to yeah. speak. But uh, as I say again, I, I think you lead, we lead our, uh, richer lives. Is this the way you were when you were a child in Dayton, yes. Ohio? Yes, I was. I, uh, my... Uh, my life is not unique to that of many mm -hmm. others. Uh, it's you were an only child. I was much, only is, child. much is made of that by yes, certain right. people, isn't it? As though it I always get about it and I say, uh, I didn't have any brothers or sisters, but that means I'm first on the will. <laughs> um, my father, uh, interestingly enough, is 75 today. My mother died a few years ago. Uh, she was in radio in Ohio. My father was born in Ohio. I was born in Ohio. Mm -hmm. um, my uh, father and mother were divorced when I was seven years old. This was a blow to you at the yeah, age of seven, it was. of course. It would be it's a blow to any child. Of course. Because, as you know only too well, children are very cruel, and, and kids would come uh, and say, uh, Hey, uh, where's your old man? 
and I'd say, well, he was off in the Army, which he was. He was in the 3C camp out in uh, Utah and Idaho. And they'd say, ah, your old man's dead, or you don't have an old man. And I said, yes, I do have an old man. He's very much alive. But uh, I'd run around uh, in back of a tree and cry and then come back, and uh, it, uh, it, was a, it was a tough time for me. Humor so often is a, a shield against pain or frustration. Emerson once it? said a great thing, which I've never forgotten. He said, humor is the mistress of sorrow. Yes. I think that's great. So in a sense, a person of your sensitivities with this kind of a life might even be driven into humor as a kind of protection. Oh, sure. Want, uh, oh, sure. It's a, it's a great shield, a great sheet of armor for mm -hmm. you. You dropped out of high school, ultimately, to join yes. the Marines at the age of 17. That's right. Now, why did you join the Marines? Of course, it was the war very, was on. Well, it's time. a very simple story. Um, there are terms that you hear in school uh, that teachers will say to parents, the boy's slow, uh, which is a kind word for saying the boy is dumb. Um, I was not, I don't think, dumb. Uh, I was very backward in one subject, which I'm now backward more than ever because of how it, the, the changes over the years, and that's mathematics. Hmm. My father was a mathematician. My stepfather, no less, was a mathematician, was an engineer, my father being an investment broker. And I was pathetic at math. I can go back instantly. I have almost total recall when my father would say, if I give you one apple, and give you seven apples, how many apples do you have? And I would say, with my little funny humor, you have too many. <laughs> <laughs> Which laid a big balloon, you yes. know. But um, no, I knew that I was failing. I knew I was in trouble. I was in trouble emotionally. I was in trouble with my studies. I was in trouble in every department. Uh, the war was on, gave me a great excuse to join the Marines, which I ran right down to the mm -hmm. post office, raised my hand, and I was in in an hour. And off to the Pacific. Off to, yes. I, uh, I, I spent uh, six months in Naval Hospital before I went over. I had acute nephritis, a kidney disease, no less. And spent a year, uh, only a year overseas. I was a seagoing Marine. I was on the, um, interestingly enough, the only aircraft carrier, uh, Essex-class carrier, that wasn't hit, the Bonham Richard, or Bonham Richard, mm -hmm. CV-31. We were the only big one that wasn't hit. Mm. And we'd, we almost got it. Yeah. It's been written about you that you were greatly influenced by a grandfather who, yes. was, who was a banker and influenced right. in, the, in terms of comedy. Now, yes, bankers right. and comedy don't go very My well My grandfather's name, who I always thought was a great, and his name, a theatrical name, was Valentine Winters. Hmm. V.W., V. Winters. And um, he had a great sense of humor. He, was a, he, he told me, he said, I wish, I wish someplace, maybe in the next life, I can be in show business. I know I can't in this life. He was a banker. He lost the bank in the Depression, mm -hmm. and we became uh, very poor in a matter of seconds. But um, he had a great sense of humor. He loved show people. He uh, was in amateur shows back in Ohio. He used to take a little funny uh, wagon and horses down to a little town called Bellbrook, and they'd put on shows. Uh, he had a number of friends in show business. Uh, Grant Mitchell, if you'd right, remember him, a character actor. Minna Gomble was another woman that he knew, an actress. And uh, he took me to Hollywood to meet some of these really? people. Uh, we took the train in those days. This is 1940, a year before the war, and had a fascinating time. He, mm. was, uh, he told me a, fa a story I must tell you. Mm. In my house, I have a photograph of him. Several, but one great one, which is a classic photograph. It's in a Mark Cross leather frame. And in the picture, I know a few pictures who are titled this way, certainly to their grandchildren, or uh, taken this way. And the title is to Bozo. He called me Bozo, not Johnny or John. Uh, he called me Bozo from Bozo Snyder and Sliding Billy Watson. They were a, a burlesque team. So he, called, he said to Bozo from your old college chum. <laughs> alias Valentine Winters. That was his title, which I yeah. just cherish. It's yes. great hip humor for a 77-year-old man. And then he had on a Hamburg hat, he had a, a cashmere scarf and an overcoat. And I said, why, like anybody would say, why would you wear a Hamburg, a cashmere scarf, and an overcoat? He said, first of all, I have very thin hair. I'm very conscious mm -hmm. of that. And the people in the years to come will say, uh, uh, why the hat and this and that? But 
they'll never know that I lost my hair. Number two, uh, I have a lot of wrinkles, and I look like somewhat like a turkey gobbler here, and I'm very sensitive about that. So I put the scarf on to hide them. Makes sense, right? Then he said, last of all, and I said, why the overcoat? He said it was damn cold in the studio. <laughs> and that's the, that's the story. Was he a mimic at all? Did you get yes. to mimicry oh, from him? Oh, yes. He did a lot. We, uh, uh, when the Depression hit, uh, like many people, uh, they turned their homes, big or small, into boarding houses. So our, the old house that uh, my grandfather lived in uh, up until the time he died uh, turned into a boarding house. And we had, a, oh, I guess about a half a dozen people that lived in this big house. And he would mimic all of them. He had one guy that had a rug, you know, a wig, mm. and he called him Lord Falstatch. <laughs> and, of course, this man hated him for it, but he was guest in the house, mm. and he went along with it. But he always said, I remember my grandfather saying, uh, Good evening, Lord Falstatch. Oh, boy. <laughs> this guy go, please, you know. But he was funny. Yeah. He was a great guy, great sense of humor, great gentleman. After the war, you came back and finished high school and then went on to the Dayton Art Institute. Right. Obviously, yeah. you were motivated to go into art. Commercial art? I went to uh, college. I went to Kenyon. I always mm -hmm. say I was in Ohio. I was in college for about an hour. It seemed no more than that. Mm -hmm. I was heavy in the sauce those days, yes, like many people. Uh, it seemed like many people because I, I thought everybody was bombed around me. I thought everybody was bombed in the service, uh, and many were. Mm -hmm. But I, uh, I was having a great party. I had emerged as not a victor or anything or a hero, but I'd, uh, I'd survived, if nothing else. So I continued to party. I was in Kenyon about a year and dropped out, again because of my studies. Mm -hmm. I was a problem student, obviously. But I did want to be an artist. I, uh, I went to the Dayton Art Institute, a fine little school in Dayton, not like that. When my wife went to Sarasota and also to Colorado Springs. She got her master's degree at Ohio State. But you met her at Dayton. Yes, I met her in Dayton. She's a Dayton gal. Mm -hmm. And I studied for, for three years in Dayton. What were the, the roots of the interest in art, you know? No, because neither one of my uh, parents painted, yeah. not anybody in my family to my knowledge. But I, I wanted to be, of all things, Jim, when it started out, a political cartoonist. Oh. But I dropped that. And um, today, uh, I, I painted over the years. I went through a period where I was, as I say, in trouble uh, in many departments and uh, couldn't get it together. But in 1960, I uh, started to paint again. And uh, did not a lot, but a number of paintings and drawings and inks. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, three years ago, I sat down with my manager, George Spoda, and I said, I want to do my first art show here in Los Angeles. They may very well put me in the sink, uh, the critics, yeah. but I don't care. Uh, I want to do it. I think it's time. It's something I want to turn mm -hmm. to in a handful of years when I retire. And so I did it, and I got a great That's notice. That's after about 10 years of, yeah, of going right. back to painting again. So it took me these past three years uh, to put this show together. Uh, it took me three years to do about um, close to 60 paintings. Yeah. I'd like to take a look at several sure. of those, Jonathan, because they're, they're unique. I know very little about art. Well, the great thing about uh, the critic, who is a top guy on the coast, his name is Henry Seldes. Mm -hmm. He compared me to uh, uh, Paul Clay and mm -hmm. to uh, a Belgian painter called, uh, mm -hmm. yes, Miro, yeah. but to uh, a Belgian painter called Rene Magritte. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, yes, because uh, this one in particular uh, reminds me just a bit of, of uh, well, that one doesn't, of Miro. No, he, he, uh, he took it away first. Oh. You have to put it back. Yeah. No, he's got, wait a minute, put the other one back here, if you will. The one in your hand. We haven't seen that. <laughs> That's it. That's right. Um, That's th the one that reminds this is, me yeah. so much of Miro. This is called, uh, this is called the Umbrella, the Umbrella Dancers. Mm -hmm. And um, this is one of my wife's favorite and one of mine. It's uh, Interestingly enough, it was done on canvas board. Most of my things are on canvas, actually. Mm -hmm. It's done on board, but we've kept this. This wasn't for sale on the show. I just liked it. It has a Miro quality mm -hmm. to it, really. Mm -hmm. Is there any relationship in your own mind to what you paint and what you perform? Yes, some of it. Most of it, I, I, a lot of it, granted, is comedy. Uh, but mm -hmm. there's some strong statements that I feel very strongly about and that I've said in my paintings. You'll see here is one which I think is rather timely. Uh, this is Watergate, 1973, and you can see the people coming out of the telephone, oh, yeah. which are the people involved in the administration and the people here in the country. Mm -hmm. The telephone uh, with the red, white, and blue represents naturally the country. Number one is the president. 
the heart of the nation, uh, the ladybugs are the bug, uh, the bugging of the phones, the mm. big bug. Uh, the wire is just oh, a fraction of an inch from being attached to the ladybug because to date the president hasn't been labeled certainly completely yes. guilty. Mm. Hmm. So that's Watergate. Let's take a look at the next one. Uh, this is what I, I feel very strongly about. This is uh, Wounded Knee, which, mm -hmm. as most Americans know, took place, a very tragic thing, not too long ago, not too many months ago. I'm part Indian. I'm a 16th. Uh, so although it's a fraction, uh, it, uh, I'm very proud of that uh, 16th, uh, 16th Cherokee. The feathers represent, naturally, the Indian, the torn American flag, uh, mm -hmm. the money, which uh, affects all of us, uh, the two rabbits with the arrows. Uh, it's all there. Mm. You've taken a considerable interest in, in the Indians uh, yes. in recent years. I have you? a little uh, thing here yeah. which uh, you can see is an Indian. Uh, uh, this is Cheyenne. I was told mm -hmm. sir, uh, by the uh, Plains Indians. Uh, they do a lot of beaded work. This uh, ring I bought in mm -hmm. Sedona not too long ago. The Navajos make that, mm -hmm. that turquoise which has become very Why has popular. it been, why have we taken so long to take this deep interest in the plight of the Indian? Well, I tell you very honestly, the Indian I said to somebody the other day, is not a very chic minority. Uh, someone once said to me, uh, again, not too long ago, well, we're talking about 800,000 people, who cares? Mm. Which is some, some kind of statement. Um, that in itself makes a reason. 800,000, good Lord, the people that, that own this country, the, the 48 states, and uh, uh, developed it and uh, their philosophy, their whole thing uh, was buried for so many years. Uh, it's a very tragic thing. And when people say, what can I do for the American Indian? Or again, what's the, what's the major problem? Well, it's almost easy and yet it's very difficult. It's not just starvation. It's not just the economy and jobs or blending into the white society. The problem is right there in that television set. Every minority, or at least almost every minority, 90% of them, and look into that magic box and say, hey, I can identify with somebody. Mm -hmm. Their own culture Their is own just culture. being swallowed up. The yeah. Indian doesn't have any hero. Yeah. Maybe a football player like um, uh, uh, the boy that played uh, up here uh, for Washington. I can't for a minute mm -hmm. think of his name. Um, uh, Johnny Sixkiller. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim Plunkett, I think, uh, Indian. Uh, there, but uh, two men, you know. Yeah. Used to be Ali Reynolds, uh, who pitched for the Yankees. but. The kids, it's not enough. They need some heroes. They need a guy at second base. They need a guy in Washington. They need a painter. They have some wonderful, fantastic painters, but they need a man like Andrew Wyeth or Picasso. They need some names to say, hey, there's some of our people. That's the way you find your own identity, isn't it? In, right. in people outside yeah. yourself that right. gives you that identity. Yeah. Yeah. You, uh, I'm going to go back now. Your, your, yeah. your uh, history of performance, I think, is, is extremely well known. But you did begin in an amateur hour, so I understand yes. that your wife persuaded you to... to That's uh, right. I'll tell you, you're talking about art for a minute again. When I was in art school, I was in my third year, Jim. And my wife sat and looked at my things. I brought them home one evening. And uh, she said, you know, your stuff stinks. Which is a rather <laughs> strong statement. Yes. Even from a wife. Yeah, it's not just a little, you're just missing, or it's not mm. bad. It stinks. And I began to look at it, and I said, you know, sweetheart, I, you're right. And she said, you're not ready to become an artist, and I'm not ready to starve. So uh, thank God for her and many th uh, little things that happened, but she was right. I wasn't ready. It, did, uh, it was bad. But I didn't have a wrist wristwatch at the time, and she saw an ad in the paper about an amateur show at the Colonial Theater in Dayton, Ohio, which is gone now. And she said, look, you're always clowning around here in school and at home. And you are funny. Uh, it's one of the reasons I married you, because you've got a great sense of humor. She said, but most of all, you need a wristwatch. Why don't you go down to the Colonial Theater and see if you can win it? Well, I went down and won it. What'd you do? And uh, I did an old routine. I, in those days, I was doing impersonations. And I did Clem McCarthy at the Indianapolis Speedway. And uh, then brought in some Hollywood characters. But I won the show, got the wristwatch, and became a disc jockey at WING mm -hmm. in Dayton. Then on up to you had till the time you had your own show on television, several shows you've yeah. had, as a matter of fact, right. and uh, have your own now. Now I have the wacky world of Jonathan Winters, mm -hmm. which is seen on Channel 2 here in CBS New York. Somebody's described what you do in performance as a kind of verbal painting, and that yeah. that uh, 
you are, I suppose, holding up a mirror to our foibles and yeah. our hypocrisies right. and so forth. But in a sense, funny as it is, and it is terribly right. funny, sure. there, there can be a kind of message. Oh, yes. It. Oh, sure. Um, my things, my show this year and this past year has been, to me, I've literally waited 24 years, because that's the length of time I've been in this business, to do this type of show. It's a mm -hmm. half hour. Good or bad, it's the way, it's like the song, I, I did it my way. And uh, it's improvisational, there's no script, no, no cue mm. cards You prefer all. that? And that's, yeah, sure. that's the way I like to work. Mm. Were there models for some of the characters you're, you're well known oh, to? Yes. What about Grandma Frickard? Is Grandma there a Frickard, model? Uh, oh yes, Grandma Frickard came from a great aunt of mine, not a great aunt, but a, a great lady. Uh, God rest her soul, she died around 84. Her name was Aunt Lou Perks. Uh, born in Springfield, Ohio, my grandmother's, my, my mother's uh, mother's sister, and four gals in the family. She was a big, heavy-set woman, and always I remember her with snow-white hair. She was a, what uh, Grandma Frickard is, she was a hip old lady. She was bright. Hmm. She uh, uh, would do something that no grandmother in those days certainly would dream of doing. She'd give me a little glass of wine and some fudge, uh, even let me hold and take a puff from a cigarette. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about age nine yes. or ten, and taught me to gamble, play poker. She was a great gal. And so I patterned um, uh, my character, Grandma Frickard, after my Aunt Lou. Mm -hmm. You must not only be observant, but must have to be a good listener. Yeah, I, uh, as much as I'm talking today, I'm greatly like a sponge. I move in and soak it all in. I, I've said this, which I think is a is an interesting analysis. I believe this to be true. I said to a group of students, I'm not one to lecture to many students because of my brief career as a student and in college and high school, but I once told them, I said, you know, you and I have the same talent. It sounds a little strange and some people raise some eyebrows and say, no, oh, come on. But it's true. This is what I believe to be true. This is the greatest movie camera in the world. Better than any Nikon, Zeiss, Kodak, what have you. This is the greatest sound equipment in the world. All of us are listening basically in, when we're in the room, in the streets, what have you, in the meadows, to the same sounds. And we're taking the same pictures as we pan around. Mm. The thing being, you're the editor, and it's how often you go to your dark room to develop what you've seen in her. It's also a state of mind, isn't it, sure. Jonathan? It's the way in which you look at things. You yeah. can look at them and uh, uh, off to the side, so to right. speak, and they become very funny. We're yeah. looking at them head on, that's and right. that can be frightening, serious, or whatever. Yeah. Mm. So that your humor is a kind of indirection. It's always a little a, 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 right. a, a mirror that reflects yeah. right. uh, a, a, the, an askew image, I right. suppose. Yeah. Mm. You quit the uh, nightclub appearance business right. because you wanted to be home. You said yeah, I wanted to being be a, home. Being a parent was terribly important to you. Very, and I'm not a bit sorry. I stayed out of clubs for 12 years. I went back just about a year or so ago. Mm -hmm. Because of the economy and the prices, yeah. and it is uh, a lot of bread, as they say, and so I went back. But I, for those 12 years, my boy once came to me here in Mamaroneck, New York, where we lived. And he said, you know, Dad, he said, can you go fishing today? Very simple little story, yeah. but it said an awful lot, and he said an awful lot. And I said, oh, Jay, I've got to go to St. Louis. I'm out there in the chase. Yeah. And he said, Dad, you're always going somewhere. Yeah. And I said, well, I've got to make a living, Jay. He said, you know, I don't dig fishing alone. And that brought tears to my eyes. And I said, you're not going to be fishing alone anymore, my friend. So I got on uh, the phone to my agent. And I said at the time, I said, uh, Marty, I said, uh, I'm not doing any more clubs. He said, you're kidding. A lot of money. No, I'm sorry. Hmm. I've got a boy who wants to fish. And we're going to fish. And what do you wish for your children, you, other than not having to fish alone? Well, uh, I've got two wonderful kids. I've got a boy who's on his way now to Guatemala. He's someplace uh, deep in Mexico. Uh, uh, he dropped us a card the other day. He's not the greatest writer in the world, mm -hmm. like a lot of kids, right. a lot of adults for that mm -hmm. matter. He's 1,700 miles deep into uh, the mm -hmm. southern part of the continent. and. Uh, 
Uh, he uh, worked hard for a year driving a truck. He's unlike a lot of kids in show business uh, that uh, got their big car, or little car, what have you, living a lush life. I'd rather have him see him, I'd rather have him work for yeah, us, I suppose. Yeah, exactly, and he is. He's a good boy. And my daughter, uh, he, he'll be 24 in February. My daughter was just uh, 17 in July. She's very pretty and talented girl, worked at Universal in the parking lot, no less, mm -hmm. uh, directing people to park their cars. How do you feel you? about young people, not your own, but you've worked you're idolized by... I have people. a lot, a lot of faith in have young you? people. I think mm -hmm. they're going to turn this whole thing around. I think they've turned it halfway around already. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, I'll tell you a strange thing. I think that this, uh, not dismissing uh, young people, but mm -hmm. for a minute, uh, because it, it has to do with young people, are certainly affected like all of us. The energy crisis to me is one of the great blessings of the world. The Arabs in their strange warped way have done us not in, but a good turn, I believe, because... I think, thank God, we're going to go back maybe to bicycles. Yes. And we, not that you can bicycle on the uh, West Side Highway, because you can't, or the freeways in L.A., or the turnpikes, but you can in your community go to the grocery store, which I expect to do. My Christmas present mm -hmm. to myself is going to be a, a new bicycle. I'm going to put a little basket on it, and by gosh, instead of going eight blocks to the grocery, I'm going to mm -hmm. ride a bicycle. Yes. Enjoying life again. Yeah. And not just the acquisition of material right. things. Exactly. Let me, in the, in the minute remaining, yeah. Jonathan, ask you one question about privacy. Mm. It becomes a kind of privilege to a person who's constantly in the public eye as you are, does it not? Right. Is it something that you, you cherish, that you fight for? Or does it come now more easily? Well, uh, we all live, we that are in the industry, in politics, um, we live in glass houses. Mm. Uh, it's difficult, naturally. Uh, for a number of reasons. You're always, you know, there. Camera, so to speak, of life, that sounds a little trite, is on you. Mm. Um, but I, uh, I'm a very private person. I'm a very much of a loner, although I've been married 25 years. I, I like to go up to Zuma Beach out there in L.A. and look at Jonathan Livingston Seagull soar around and uh, take my sketch pad and my AM, FM radio and kind of listen to that. Uh, it's difficult for me in, in public. Uh, I'm basically a very shy person. But um, I know that uh, in not too many years I'm going to pack it in as mm. far as show business and go to my painting. So uh, I'll, be, uh, I'll be out of the public's way or out of their, or in their way uh, in a handful of years. But I'm glad you were able to overcome your shyness long enough to spend this half hour with Thank us. You, Thank Jim. you very much. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you.